Good evening. The 2021 World Press Freedom Index has again placed India at the 142nd rank out of 180 countries. The Reporters Without Borders report says that India is one of the world's most dangerous countries for journalists trying to do their jobs properly. Today, the 16th of November is celebrated as National Press Day and it is to commemorate the idea of a free and responsible press in our country, while acknowledging and honoring the Press Council of India and its role in ensuring this. But may I ask, is our press actually free? Is our news media doing responsible and ethical journalism? On behalf of the Department of Media Studies, Christ deemed to be University, Bangalore Central Campus, we would like to welcome all of you to this special guest lecture organized on the occasion of National Press Day 2021. This event is held with the support of the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Alliance, of which the Department of Media Studies at Christ is a member. We are happy to have participants from different institutions around the country. I am Nikita Sebastian of Second Year JP English, your, your host for the evening. In these times, journalists in our country are jailed, ambushed and threatened by the police, politicians, criminal groups or corrupt local officials. We have seen the recent incident in the state of Tripura, where two women journalists were jailed for reporting on anti-Muslim violence and were granted bail yesterday. The other day, a freelance reporter was murdered for investigating illegal clinics in Bihar. The press also faces problems of credibility, fake news and the lack of quality and diversity in the newsroom shows an increasing disconnect with the real lives of people in the country and most important issues they face. On the other side, we have the crisis due to COVID and how many journalists have been laid off and lost their jobs. It is natural to feel that there is no hope. It is in such a context that it is vital to listen to one of the most important voices in the field of journalism today, Emily Schmoll, South Asian correspondent for the New York Times. It is our honor to have her with us today to talk about, to talk about her lessons from reporting India and the world. Emily Schmoll is an award-winning South Asia correspondent for the New York Times, based in New Delhi. She came to the Times from the Associated Press, where she covered South Asia. For the last three years, she has covered government policy, social uprisings, wealth and inequality, and the rise of Hindu nationalism. Previously, she was an AP correspondent in Texas, writing about the natural gas boom, environment disasters, and the plague of mass shootings. Before joining AP, she was a roving foreign correspondent with datelines from a dozen countries across five continents. Emily's writings has appeared in other publications, including the BBC, the Miami Herald, Newsweek, the Financial Times, Christian Science Monitor, World Policy Journal, Salon, and Forbes. She won awards for her coverage of Ebola in Dallas for an investigation of sexual assaults in US public schools. She holds a bachelor's degree in Spanish from Bard College and a master's in journalism from Columbia University. Thank you for accepting our invitation to be here with us on this occasion, Emily Ma'am. The audience may post their questions in the YouTube chat and we shall share them with the guests at the end of the lecture. A feedback form will also be shared with all the participants at the end of the session. Please do fill it in. Over to you, Emily Ma'am, to deliver your lecture. Nikita, thank you so much for such a smart and comprehensive introduction. It is such an honor to be here today for India's National Press Freedom Day, and there's so much to talk about. I have been given a generous amount of time to give my lecture, but if there are questions, I'd really like to take them um, earlier because I'd really like to have a conversation with you all about the fears and apprehensions you may have about entering journalism in the world we live in at the moment and under the constraints that Nikita just so eloquently described. Um, and also just talk to you about the aspects of working as a journalist that maybe aren't necessarily talked about so much in journalism school or in media studies programs, which is just how the job tends to bleed over into every other aspect of life. 
Um, but once again, I just want to thank you. Thanks to Christ University for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, we're going to start with a short video clip from Haiti. More than 2,000 people have died from a cholera epidemic that has ravaged Haiti since October. In a report this week, a French scientist links the disease to a United Nations base. Experts say the main reason the disease is spreading is a lack of access to clean water. Then we are in Sart in uh, Poroprince. It's uh, an area in the south of Poroprince. My name is Virginie. Virginie uh, Cadelier is a Doctors Without Borders nurse at the Sart Cholera Treatment Center in the south of Port-au-Prince. And the epidemiologic uh, thing with the number that we will have uh, like 500, 500 admission per day in uh, one week. That's why we try to increase, increase the capacity because we don't know how we can really uh, manage in the future. The Haitian government and international aid groups deliver clean water around Port-au-Prince. Still, the number of new cases continues to rise. You know, uh, since uh, the earthquake, you know, there is a bad uh, war problem of water in Haiti. So That's McKinsey's son of Ulis. His job is to add 800 milliliters of chlorine to 65 Mack trucks filled with water the government pumps from the ground. The trucks take the water to tent camps and in poor neighborhoods throughout the city. Doctors say delivering chlorinated water will go a long way in keeping the disease from spreading. But most Haitians also buy water on the street. Those who can afford it pick up $1 eight ounce packets. At the U National Company, water is treated with reverse osmosis, carbon filters, and UV rays to eliminate bacteria. But private water companies aren't regulated, so much of the water consumed in the capital isn't treated. Nearly a year after Haiti's devastating earthquake, 1.3 million people remain in tent camps. In many of the camps, water is sparse. Jezeline Sanatas is 18 and pregnant. She lives with her dad and four siblings in Canaan III, a tarp settlement outside Port-au-Prince. Trucks bring in water twice a day, but it's not enough for the 12,000 families who live there. Jazeline says she often goes to bed thirsty. To address the water problem, the residents dug a 20-foot deep well. They boil the water drawn from the well twice to kill bacteria and hope that cholera isn't their next disaster. Thank you. So I wanted to start with that report that I did for the Guardian um, in Haiti because I want to talk to you about um, what it's like to cover developing countries, to cover public health, natural disasters, and um, the toll that it can take um, to be a witness to, to these kinds of suffering. So in January 2010, I was a passenger on a Black Hawk helicopter flying to Haiti to witness the greatest destruction I had ever seen. I was a freelance reporter getting paid very little and it was among the most thrilling experiences of my life. I had started my career as a sub editor at the Miami Herald, which is a regional newspaper in the US, but I longed to be a reporter. So I took a job as a reporter at a financial magazine called Forbes. And there, I really loved being able to write, but I wanted to be closer to the news. So about five years into my career in journalism, I went to graduate school and shortly after that launched a four year stint covering three continents from four different countries. It was crazy. I now know, but it was immersive and educational and an amazing privilege. For 10 days back in 2010, I slept on a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier, taking sorties in every morning to report from Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti and the epicenter of a devastating earthquake, and returning to the safety of the sea, which is impervious to earthquake aftershocks, after filing my stories. Later, Haiti was struck with a cholera outbreak. The same United Nations troops who were sent there to help people brought the disease. 
I had to learn how to navigate covering not only a desperate country where kidnapping and shootings were not uncommon, but a contagious disease in a place with few health facilities. That learning would come in handy again and again, as you can imagine. Reporting from Haiti was traumatizing and it was also exhilarating. On that trip and two others to Haiti that I took that year, it was like this affirmation for me that foreign reporting was what I was put on this earth to do. In my career, which has now spanned 17 years in five continents, I've done all kinds of journalism, some for big name places like the New York Times, other for no name online news sources that folded almost as quickly as they launched. I've learned to not be sentimental, too sentimental anyway, about any particular story, but instead to try to be as present as possible to the story of that moment. Still, there are stories that will always stay with me and that have shaped my career and the world we find ourselves in today. The 2010 earthquake was one of them. It opened my eyes to the depths to which people sometimes suffer, the tremendous losses, the resilience, and the reality that covering stories about death and destruction, whether natural or man-made, takes a toll on those of us there to witness and document it. A year after the Haiti earthquake, I found myself in Liberia, in Liberia, a tiny country in West Africa that has a very unusual history and a unique, a unique tie to my home country, the United States. Liberia was established as a republic in the 19th century by three American Blacks, some of them the children of abolitionists who found them sort of an inconvenient feature of 19th century life. So they sent them on ships to bring Christianity to Africa. Most people died, if not on the Atlantic Ocean, then when they reached the mosquito infested shores. And I was so curious about this country that had been ravaged by civil war, but had gone on to elect Africa's first woman president. I went for a year to run an NGO that mentors young African reporters. We did all sorts of multimedia journalism um, from writing for print and online publications to producing radio and TV pieces. We took our own photographs and we worked with very, very limited internet bandwidth. Uh, but we managed to sell a bunch of stories to US and British outlets together. And I again learned the great privilege of being a witness, um, both to tremendous human suffering, but to tremendous resilience. And I also learned how interconnected the world has become. And as I learned it, I became just obsessed with sharing that learning with the world. So a few years after leaving Liberia, I was a Texas correspondent for the Associated Press, which is America's oldest newswire. And West Africa and Liberia at this time was in the news because an outbreak of the Ebola virus was spreading fast and killing thousands of people. Um, now at this point, my surroundings in suburban Texas could not have been any more different from Monrovia, the capital of Liberia. And yet these two worlds collided for me when during this Ebola outbreak, a, Liber a Liberian man boarded a plane to Dallas. When the man who was named Thomas Eric Duncan fell sick and the disease started to spread out from the Dallas hospital where he was treated, the world's press descended on Texas. It came as a huge surprise to a lot of people that a public health disaster ravishing a country on the other side of the world and, and across the Atlantic Ocean in Liberia could reach them in the US. And it was a big wake up call of how interconnected the world had become, sort of how vulnerable. Um, and because I had been lucky enough to spend a year in Liberia, I was uniquely positioned to tell the story of this man who arrived in Texas. So I worked the phones. I called sources in Monrovia and uh, talked to the Liberian family this man had come to visit, um, a Liberian refugee and her children, who felt that they could trust me with their story because I was able to show some appreciation for their culture. Um, a source in Liberia gave me pictures of Thomas Eric Duncan, and these were the first images the world saw of him. 
My phone interviews with his fiance, who was quarantined in Dallas, featured in AP radio reports, and the full set of hospital records that his family entrusted me with became the basis for an investigation into how a major American hospital had failed to prepare for an epidemic like this, letting its guard down, failing to protect its nursing staff, and ultimately letting a man die. During my tenure with the AP in Texas, uh, my curiosity and my personal experiences with the place uh, helped to ease people to talking to me. And even now, when I have to talk to people about a personal tragedy, I really try to let myself feel a little bit of what people are feeling, whether heartbreak or terror, just so that I can show some genuine empathy with what people are going through. Of course, we journalists have to remain perennial outsiders, never growing too close to our subjects or our stories. But I have found that when I have allowed myself to be vulnerable to deeply vulnerable people, they have found it worth the time and sometimes the agony to tell me their stories. My proudest achievement at the AP was an investigation into sexual assaults in schools, a taboo subject that we had to report with extreme sensitivity. If you could please show that clip now. Investigative report finds a disturbing pattern. Sexual abuse of students by other students happens more frequently in schools than reported, and the consequences for the offenders vary considerably. Jeffrey Brown has that story. A hidden horror educators have long been warned not to ignore. That's the description of sexual abuse in schools by the Associated Press, which published his story today. AP reporters found that students were seven times more likely than adults to sexually assault another student. During a four-year period, the AP tallied at least 17,000 cases around the country. These included many cases that were treated as bullying or hazing instead. Emily Schmall is a member of the AP team. She joins me now from Dallas. Emily, thanks for joining us. One key point you're making is, th is that this happens more often than we know, right? Is it possible to say how pervasive it is? Yes, that's absolutely true. It, it happens far more often, I think, than people realize. To say exactly how pervasive it is, it's difficult, though, because just like rape and sexual assault perpetrated in other places, uh, rape and sexual assault in schools is definitely underreported. Uh, so while we have been able to about 17,000 incidents over the four years. Experts have told us it's just the tip of the iceberg. So let's establish what we are talking about. Really, we're going beyond bullying, beyond hazing. Tell us, tell us, the, tell us what you're looking at exactly. Yes, yeah, so we were very, very deliberate in what we counted. And we are looking at sexual assault as defined by the Justice Department, which means forced intercourse or sodomy, uh, forced oral sex, um, the most severe forms of sexual assault. We deliberately did not include categories like sexual harassment or bullying, even though, as you noted, sometimes sex assaults are reported as these things. Well, so if you look at the rules governing schools, I gather that it, it really varies from state to state in terms of how much this is tracked and what kind of actions are taken. Yes, and even sometimes within school districts, there's no federal requirement that says schools have to track student-on-student -student sex assault. Even though for a long time, schools have been tracking things like free and reduced lunch, uh, guns and drugs on school property, um, this is just something that they are not obligated to track. So various states uh, do collect some sort of information, but it's inconsistent state to state. Um, and a lot of times school districts sort of have the discretion over how they report these things. Um, therefore, in a case, there have been plenty of cases we've found where they've led to a criminal charge, but the act itself was categorized and reported to the state as bullying or as sexual harassment or as a lesser form of sex offense. You referred to this a little bit earlier, uh, Emily, just in terms of why these cases float so much under the radar, why we know so little. Spell that out a little bit. Yeah, 
Yeah, so the experts we spoke to said there's just a real reluctance on the part of not only school administrators, but parents as well, to acknowledge this for what it is. They have a hard time recognizing that kids of such a young age can be perpetrators or be victimized in this way. Um, so that's part of it. There's, the other part is that a lot of schools um, have said that they aren't really aware of what they're supposed to do when an allegation of sexual assault uh, between students surfaces. Um, and then lastly, some experts have actually said that schools are just looking after their public image more than they are the victims. And of course, in the wider public, it's just something hard for all of us to even want to discuss, I assume. I think so. I mean, I think there's still really a stigma about sexual violence, not only in the context of K-12 schools, but in our country at large. So it's even more intense um, at the younger school level. Well, so what can or should be done? What, what for parents, for educators, what, what are the experts telling you? Well, the experts are saying that, you know, there's a real reluctance um, among not only school administrators, but parents as well to, to acknowledge even that this is happening and that kids of such a young age are perpetrating these kinds of offenses. So the experts say that it needs to be recognized for what it is. Uh, there's a lot of there are a lot of people working in the space of how we solve this, how we empower other kids to report it. Um, it's actually something that we're going to be taking on later on in the series. Um, our stories are running every Monday in May. All right, Emily Schmall of the AP, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. So as you could see from that clip that, you know, sex assaults in schools were not a new problem in the U.S. and they are far from being limited to happening only in the U.S. In fact, during my reporting trips around the world, I had heard about young children being the victims of sexual assault again and again. But in the U.S., no one before the reporting team I was on had ever tried to quantify the problem in a systematic way. And we know that until you can quantify a problem, it's very difficult to, to solve it. So we had to go to all 50 American states to request data. And we also had to work with families uh, and with children who have been abused and ask them to trust us that if they exposed themselves, um, if they were willing to tell their stories, um, it, it might make a change. And changes from our reporting did come. States started tracking sex assaults in schools more systematically, and the vice president's office started talking about it. Okay, so this now brings me to, me to India and the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I'll cue the video in a second, but just when I moved to India in 2018, I was absolutely terrified. I had never been to India. I'd never actually even been to Asia, but I longed to return to foreign reporting and had always been deeply curious about this ancient place. So when the AP asked me to go, I didn't really hesitate. It was another chance in my career to cover a big story, to potentially do good and to be changed by the work and the experience. I found India to be among the most challenging of any assignment I ever had. Um, the pollution in Delhi, the population, the poverty, and the nonstop news, it was a sharp learning curve, even for someone with more than a decade of professional ex experience in journalism under my belt. Then the pandemic came. Could you please cue the video? So taking you now to India, we talked about this earlier, where the coronavirus is spiraling out of control. The country has reported more than 300,000 new cases for the sixth day in a row. Over 2,700 people uh, died as a result of the virus in the last 24 hours alone. Now other nations are pledging their support. So Lucy Kraft reports.
Scenes of tragedy play out daily at the gates of Indian hospitals with the desperately ill and their families left to fend for themselves. This man said, I took my relative to two hospitals, but they refused to admit him. We are standing here with a patient in the middle of the road, without oxygen, without any hope. With even hospitals struggling to source vital supplies, finding a coveted hospital bed no longer guarantees treatment. This man said, my mother is admitted here and I don't think they are taking good care of her. The oxygen cylinders need to be filled every half hour, but they are not even checking them. The vertical spike in cases and deaths has unnerved even those long accustomed to handling last rites. There are reports of cremation workers running out of wood for funerals. Cremations are being conducted non-stop, even on roadsides. I've never seen such a terrifying situation. I can't believe we're in the capital of India. People are dying like animals, this cremation worker said. Even with the U.S., the U.K. and other countries starting to ship supplies and India repurposing sports stadiums, passenger trains, and even religious spaces for temporary treatment centers, India is bracing for cases and fatalities to continue spiraling over the next few weeks. COVID safety protocols like social distancing have waned in recent months. Large crowds have gathered at political rallies and religious ceremonies. India's humanitarian crisis is a reminder, World Health Organization officials said, that even as some countries venture a return to normalcy, COVID remains a global menace, and nations that open up too soon risk becoming the next India. That was Lucy Kraft reporting from Tokyo. Now I want to bring in Emily Schmall, a South Asia correspondent at the New York Times to talk more about the latest um, out of India. So Emily, look, you know, every country has dealt with sort of a second and in some cases a third surge of this virus. We know that's how it works. There's going to be a cycle. Um, and so in many ways, this is another surge in India, but it's way more than a surge. It's worse than it was the first time around. Why are we seeing this tremendous spike now? Well, experts don't know for sure, but they have some theories. One is that, um, the, the virus the first time around mostly resulted in mild cases. The death count wasn't uh, very high compared to other countries that had been also really hard hit. Um, and it seems that there's a new variant circulating. It's considered to have a double variation um, or a double mutation rather that is far deadlier and that's infecting far more people. The first time around, younger people were largely spared from the disease, but this time um, hospitals are reporting that many young people are also showing up looking for beds and support. So India is finally getting the attention of other countries. What kind of aid are other countries pledging and is the Indian government open to it? Yeah, I think the Indian government is certainly receptive to aid at this point. I think there's some general recognition that um, it needs this to be able to stop this catastrophe. But the problem is, is that, for instance, with oxygen, India has potentially a sufficient amount of medical oxygen, but it doesn't have the transportation and the logistics it needs to get this oxygen to hospitals on time. So what we're seeing is tragically a lot of hospitals um, sending out these SOS messages on Twitter and other social media saying that they're 45 minutes away from uh, depleting their oxygen supplies and asking for help. And then these um, oxygen tanks racing to get there and sometimes arriving literally 10 or 15 minutes too late and dozens of people dying. So while the US, the UK, France um, and other countries are pledging and in some cases have already delivered some supplies of um, oxygen and ventilators and other medical equipment. It still remains to be seen whether this government can coordinate a system that will get oxygen to where it's needed in time. Um, so the vaccine rollout has not been the best either in India, which is sort of ironic because India has the capability of producing a lot of vaccines. They have vaccine production sites there. In fact, there are other countries that uh, rely on India for the AstraZeneca vaccine um, because millions of doses are manufactured there. So how could the coronavirus crisis in, in India then potentially cause a ripple effect when it comes to fighting the pandemic beyond the borders of India globally? 
Yeah, well, let me just put this into a little bit of context. Back in January, when India began its own vaccination program, it started, um, like a lot of other countries, restricted to healthcare and frontline workers. And at the same time, the government of Prime Minister Narendra Modi actually gave away a good number of vaccine doses and sold vaccine doses. About 66 million have left the country since then. And, and so the feeling, the attitude seemed to be then that India was in decent shape and could afford to give away these vaccines to meatier countries. Um, but suddenly in, in late March, uh, Mr. Modi clamped down on exports of vaccine. And since then, India has been absorbing pretty much all of the 2.4 million AstraZeneca vaccines uh, doses that are made here on a daily basis. And that's still turning out not to be enough. This is a country of nearly 1.4 billion people. The AstraZeneca vaccine requires two doses. There's an indigenous vaccine that's also being distributed here. Um, but for whatever reason, the, um, the, the turnout has been relatively small. Only about 50% of healthcare workers um, came out when it was their turn. And so now on May 1st, uh, the government says anybody 18 or over can get a vaccine, but it's really not clear whether there's sufficient supplies. And then again, there's a question of organization, whether there's going to be enough organization to ensure that anybody who really does want to get a vaccine can get one. And then lastly, how this will affect right, the rest of the world hmm. is that, uh, that AstraZeneca vaccine is destined to a lot of foreign countries and it's not necessarily going to reach them until India can get control of the situation here. Yeah, we're going to actually pick up that conversation sort of in our next segment, because I know that uh, AstraZeneca was sort of the backbone of the European Union. So like everyone in India during this pandemic, I have struggled with fear and loneliness. But as a journalist, I again felt so much privilege because unlike a lot of people who felt helpless in the face of this catastrophe and human suffering, I did have a clear way to respond. I could write about it. I could do my job. I could ask people walking out of Delhi on foot where they were going and what they were leaving behind. I could listen to someone express anguish about not being able to find a hospital bed for a sick relative. I couldn't find them a bed or treat that relative, but as a journalist, I could acknowledge the reality of their suffering and, and validate that it mattered. So whether covering a public health crisis or a natural disaster, economic hardship or political change, it's just so important to be there ready to listen with your eyes and your heart open, recording audio and images and the desperate, hopeful human condition. Thank you. And perhaps if there are any questions now, we can, we can start taking them. Yes, ma'am, I'll read out the questions to you and uh, you can answer them. Yeah, just, just a second, ma'am. So the first question is, uh, what is a place you have traveled to for a story that stands out to you as the most intriguing or a fascinating place you have been to? Well, I think everywhere I've been has been pretty fascinating. Um, I found Sri Lanka really interesting. I have not been back um, since the pandemic but I was there for the last general elections and before that. And I think to me, because Sri Lanka is a country that is close in size to Liberia, where I said I was um, about a decade ago. And the two countries also have a lot in common in the sense that both were engulfed in civil war for decades. Um, but whereas Liberia is still really struggling economically, um, as anybody knows who has been to Colombo, Sri Lanka has made this amazing turnaround. They've really capitalized on tourism and agricultural exports. And, um, and they, they implement, you know, they really created some institutions. They built some institutions um, that help the country weather, you know, continued tensions in the community. 
Um, and I'd love to go back there because I think a lot has changed since the new administration came in and they're like a lot of places using the coronavirus as an excuse, I feel, to keep uh, foreign journalists from coming in and really seeing what it's like on the ground. But I'm afraid from um, what I've read and from talking to, to friends and colleagues there that there's been a real deterioration recently um, in the last couple of years of these institutions of you know, democracy itself, which is something I think we're seeing all over the world, um, but very poignantly in South Asia right now. And uh, what is the most important ethical consideration you find yourself adhering to when you are talking to someone about a deeply traumatic event for a story? That's a great question. I mean, I think um, it's really tricky because I've definitely been in situations, again, uh, Sri Lanka after the terrorist attack on Easter Sunday a couple of years ago, where I was talking to people who had just lost entire families um, and who had survived um, a, a bomb blast. And so um, sometimes one gets the sense that people are talking, they're in, in a place of shock. Um, so it's very difficult, but I really try to ensure that there is a connection made, that I'm clear about who I am and why I'm there that I, um, that, that if they're upset, I don't push the conversation any longer, um, that they have a way to reach me, that other people have a way to reach me. I follow up with stories and with links to make sure that, that there's some sort of uh, continuity in the conversation. And I've often followed up with victims of, um, crimes or disasters um, for a long time, just to kind of let them know actually, mostly that, um, that I care as a human being. I think unfortunately, um, whenever there is a big disaster, there's just a flock of journalists from everywhere. And it can be very untoward to see sometimes how journalists behave in these situations. And I've been in a lot of these and it's a really uncomfortable situation to be in. Um, so I do try to approach victims with the greatest kind of um, sympathy and sensitivity that I can muster and make sure that they're okay uh, with, with telling their story. I, I do find that some people seem to find it really cathartic. And um, those are the people I, I tend to speak to. If there's somebody who seems upset and really doesn't want to talk, I, I definitely don't press it. Ma'am, how do you cope with statistics or stories that deeply disturb you on a personal level when you need to maintain a sense of calm or objectivity while reporting them? Well, statistics are great because they're not, they're numbers, <laughs> they're not people. Um, so it's a little bit easier to digest numbers. Um, but of course, you know, at the New York Times or even at the AP, I, I can't just report numbers. I have to find stories to illustrate the numbers. I have to find people who illustrate the numbers. So um, I think it can be disturbing. You know, I'll, I'll share a couple of years ago, um, there was um, uh, some court action involving the, the men who had been arrested in the Nirbaya case and they were appealing for uh, a stay on their execution. And at the same time, there were one or two other really grisly accounts of rape and sexual assault in different parts of India. And I think we all, we all see this news every day. And I remember in that moment, just feeling a bit overwhelmed. Um, and I, I had been asked to do a story um, about one of these cases and just looking at the numbers and um, mentioning some of the, the recent cases was, difficult. I mean, it's moments like those where one realizes journalism is not just an easy, fun, sort of glamorous profession. No, it's actually really difficult sometimes. And it's really emotionally taxing to have to think um, again and again and really dwell and um, 
you know, think about the implications of, of, of these numbers, right? And what they say about the place in which one is living. Um, so um, it's difficult, but I think you do it because you, it's the job, you, you treat it as professionally and as sensitively as possible, and then make sure to, to take some time to practice self-care or whatever that looks like. Because I think I've learned what I didn't know, you know, when I was much younger and running around Port-au-Prince was that there is, these stories do take a toll and you have to take time to step away. Um, and and care for yourself because if not, you just can't do it. You just can't remain as present and as sensitive as I think um, you need to be to tell the story well. How hard is it to report in a diverse country like India? Are there any specific skills that you employ when you are reporting in a country not your own? I think India is quite a difficult place to report from um, for reasons I'm sure everybody here knows. Um, there's so many languages, there's so many cultural differences. Um, and, and it's a place with a very complicated past. I mean, for example, you know, every time I've written about Kashmir, I've had to reflect on you know, centuries of history that have sort of brought us to this moment and, and how to kind of concisely summarize that history in a way that an international audience will understand is really challenging because I don't want to be too brief because I don't want to, um, it, it's, the context is so important to understanding um, why people feel, how they feel about the issue. Um, and of course, I'm not there to take sides. I'm not there to advocate for anyone in particular. I'm just there to kind of convey the reality of the political dynamic. So it's really hard. I mean, I lean very heavily onto um, my colleagues who are Indian. And um, we often also employ fixers on the ground in parts of India where we don't have any staff, um, like much of South India, I'm afraid to say. Um, and, and it's just critical that we, we work with local reporters because there's so much that's lost when you don't understand a language. Um, all the nuance of speech, uh, humor, um, you know, just so many things are lost. So it's, it's important. I never really travel anywhere without um, a reporter who can act as sort of a translator too. And I'm, I found that it's not just a matter of translating language, it's often translating, um, you know, behavior and lifestyle and all, all sorts of things that may appear to me as a, a foreigner who grew up far away from here um, one way, but is actually a different way. So there's just a lot of layers of interpretation um, that have to be done. And I think that's true anywhere. Um, I mean, even in the United States, which is like India in many ways, it's a huge country. So when I was in Texas, uh, there, there was much that I didn't understand, even though English is spoken there. Um, I'm not from that part of the country and it's quite different. It's norms, it's politics, it's culture, it's cuisine. So I think um, wherever one is posted, even if it's in your hometown, you have to learn to apply a critical eye and to interrogate your assumptions all the time. Have you had bad experiences because of language barriers? How do you navigate being in an unfamiliar place if you cannot communicate in the local language? Um, I don't think I've had any bad experiences, but it's very, it's very difficult. And I've endeavored to learn Hindi so that I can at least um, exchange a few words with people in some parts of India. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really, really challenging. And, and what I fear is that I can't establish the kind of human to human connection that I think is so critical. Um, and maybe, maybe it's hard to know whether, you know, how critical it is. Maybe it just feels very critical to me. Um, because I want to show a certain amount of humility um, when I'm approaching people. But 
I'm afraid that 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 may be lost if I can't communicate that myself. And um, it can be confusing. I'm, <laughs> there, there have been moments um, I was with a photographer who also doesn't speak Hindi well, um, and we were um, we were kind of spending a couple of days with these cow vigilantes and um, at one moment, sort of late at night in very rural Rajasthan, something went wrong and we didn't exactly understand what was happening, but we had to leave very quickly. Um, so there have been incidents like that, but for the most part, I have found everywhere in the world um, that most people are happy to, that somebody is there to ask them their story, to to ask them to show something of themselves or how they live, um, to talk about their children, to talk about their childhood. Um, it's really amazing, but I have come to see that even in moments where we're dealing with people who are very vulnerable, because as I said, they've just experienced a loss um, or they're, they've survived something um, that was terrible, I still find it, um, that there's a lot of value, there's a lot of catharsis to a journalist being there. We're like the first responders. We're not treating the wounds, but we're there to ask a person to, to narrate what has happened to them. And I think in narrating what has happened, a person can make a bit of sense with it and come to some sense of acceptance about it almost. So um, I do think we play a really critical role. While reporting the pandemic, how did you negotiate cultural differences between people you were reporting about and your audience? That's a wonderful question. And I wanted to show the clip um, with the CBS interview because again, I didn't make that video. I was just interviewed by that CBS um, host, but because I think there was a big discussion here during the second wave about how Western media was depicting the pandemic and um, the death and dying that we were all witnessing and reading about. And I think um, there were certainly uh, members of this government and even just um, regular readers of the New York Times who expressed um, displeasure with the ways in which the Western press um, showed the extent of the trauma that we were experiencing here. And I'm speaking specifically about people running out of oxygen um, or people struggling to breathe because they didn't have access to oxygen and the funeral pyres. Um, I think that it's important, I felt it was important at the time that we as a, a profession show the ground reality that we not cover it up even though it is disturbing. It is disturbing and I, and I can appreciate that. And it was certainly disturbing to live in Delhi um, during that period because there were so many cremations that the air was really thick with smoke. Um, but I think that those images, that reporting in all likelihood motivated um, countries around the world to offer aid and India needed aid at that moment. It needed friends, it needed support um, from a logistical perspective, but also just from a uh, supplies perspective. So I think it can be argued it's that, that without that kind of reporting, it would have been difficult using numbers alone to convey just how bad it was and how badly India needed assistance at that moment. Um, but it's, it's difficult. And I'm always, in my three years here, I've had many difficult conversations with, again, mainly members of the government, but also other people who are critical of, and, and sort of suspicious of the Western media's portrayal of India. And they find that it's um, demeaning or um, that, that there's some conspiracy to portray India in a negative light. And of course, I assure them there is no conspiracy, but um, I think it's a very delicate balance and it is difficult to know, especially in a moment of a crisis, like a pandemic, um, when one has gone too far or when one hasn't gone far enough. Um, but I think that the aim that 
that I had, that my colleagues had, that the foreign press community in India had um, during this pandemic has always been the same, which is to, which is to get help for India. While well, reporting, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. How do you deal with the backlash that journalists inevitably get when they report a story that, that portrays a government, especially a foreign one in poor light? What has your worst experience been with such backlash? Um, so <laughs> in all the countries I've reported from, the Indian government has been um, the most defensive. And, and I can understand it from a historical perspective, um, why the government would be a bit touchy. And I mean, nobody, I think nobody, no government really wants journalists to scrutinize its policy and to, to check on whether it's doing what it said it would do and to point out failures. Um, but I do feel the Indian government has been particularly sensitive um, for historical reasons about the ways in which Western media in particular cover India. Um, so I've been, I've been called <laughs> into uh, various ministries at different times. I've had my articles read aloud to me in a sort of sarcastic fashion. Um, I once went into a ministry and the minister handed me this thick packet of stories of mine that he printed out um, that was a bit, I wasn't really sure why he did that, but um, I mean, for the most part, nothing, nothing terrible, far from it has happened. But um, in India right now, among foreign reporters, uh, it's pretty clear that journalists who the government doesn't like um, or whose work they don't like are at risk of having the terms of their visa circumscribed in some way. Um, or government sources just not answering the phone when they call or being attacked. Um, I recently made um, what I thought was a completely innocuous observation on Twitter. Um, and it inspired just you know, hundreds and hundreds of comments um, from people who took it to mean something completely different, but they took it as a criticism and, and it wasn't meant as one, but I think um, we're at a moment where I think all of us are trying to be even more sensitive to the fact that um, that this government is is on the offense. It has gone after journalists. It has um, tried to um, undermine the profession in some in many ways. Um, and knowing that a lot of journalists um, in India don't have necessarily the same freedom or support to be as critical as they might otherwise be because of the fact that their publications are receiving so many ad dollars from the government or for other reasons. Um, I feel like the, the foreign press feels an even greater obligation to, to cover the news really aggressively here. Um, and that usually that has some fallout. I would say pretty much every week I receive one sort of nasty message or email from someone in government. Um, and it's difficult because I really, I, I want them to know that, um, you know, I was, I was a you know, straight A student who just wants to do a good job here and that I'm trying to do my best and that um, there's no grand conspiracy. I have not, you know, I love India, but um, there are only so many times I can say that. So, Sometimes I just have to, to let it go. And I, I can't argue with them about it because I have to recognize that their going after the press is part of their political strategy. And so sometimes it's better not to engage with it. How do you view the press in our country? What do you think we have done wrong or right in India? Well, I think the press is really vibrant. I love that India is a place where people routinely read several newspapers a day. Um, I think, you know, there are great online news sources now that are scrappy and brave and doing much needed reporting. Um, 
But I do think that Indian journalism is under threat. And I do think that uh, I've seen, especially during the pandemic, um, newsrooms close bureaus and lay people off. So I know it's harder and harder to find um, a good paying staff job in Indian journalism right now. And I'm worried because I think um, there's so many brilliant young people um, who should be journalists because this country needs you. They need um, astute critical thinkers um, who are political junkies and love to write and love um, the opportunity to sort of cover this vast country and talk to people. So I think it's essential that they're there. And I it gives me a lot of optimism that there seem to continuously be new um, outlets that I'm learning about all the time that are startups. And a startup is difficult because you don't have the security of a longstanding newsroom behind you, but it's really exciting too. And I see wonderful work being done all the time. Of course, just like in my country and other countries, there are TV channels and newspapers um, that are completely biased and that tout the government's line. And um, I don't see that changing. I mean, I think in our world of uh, polarization, we're going to see only more of that. And I think there is a danger, there's a risk for all of us that we become activists rather than journalists. I think it's really important that we try to remain as neutral as possible. Um, even even when we're under attack, um, we can't take it personally and we have to detach from it a bit because I think um, delivering sort of straight and unbiased news is, has never really been more important in an environment where there's just an avalanche of information at all times. Um, but by and large, to get back to the question, I, I think Indian journalism is brave and it's gutsy and it's growing. Um, but unfortunately, I think at the same time, as I mentioned before, the role of people like me has become a bit more important. And we hear this often in the field because people are losing some faith in some of the mainstream publications, feeling that they have been um, co-opted by this government. Um, so that's that's dangerous, but it also creates opportunities for startups and new ways of approaching journalism. What was your favorite or most memorable interview so far and why? Hmm. Wow. I mean, that's a hard one. I've had so many um, memorable injuries. I guess um, I, I once went to interview uh, a Liberian senator named Prince Johnson, who had been a warlord. And I was quite intimidated about going to his house. And I'd been asking for an interview. It was around an election. And he was sort of playing the role of kingmaker in these elections. So um, everyone wanted to get him and I'd been leaving messages with his people. And finally, I was summoned kind of late at night and I went there and he was um, in his pajamas. And that was quite <laughs> surprising. And he brought out his wife and had me you know, speak to her for a little bit. I mean, he didn't even, she didn't really speak. He just sort of showed her off. Um, he showed me some things, some objects, some decorative objects in his house that um, famous people had given him over the years. And it was just the most, absurd interview um, and very little of it, you know, was, you know, appeared in the piece that I wrote um, about him. And actually that was one of many instances I've had in my career where I've taken that material and put it into my blog because I think um, in journalism, we just get so much good material, but a lot of it we can't use in the stories that we publish. So it's good to have another space, whether that's a journal or a blog, to, um, to work with that material. Because 
it's just good to exercise writing, but it's it's also good to to just take advantage of having had some experience that very few people will have had and, and try to um, convey something about that. What is your writing process like? What tips would you give us upcoming journalists with regards to writing a story that can create impact? Well, I think um, writing period is a really good practice. Um, so I would encourage people who are entering journalism to get in the habit of writing every day. Even if you feel you have nothing to write about, um, you surely do. And you can um, just force yourself into the discipline of writing every day. And when you wanna make impact, I think you, you really have to have a good awareness about the situation and what has been written. So reading all of the, the prior writings on a subject, um, doing extensive interviewing, and then understanding um, where there is a gap. So with this um, sex assault in schools investigation we did, when it, it started with a question, and I think a lot of good investigative reporting does just start with a question, which was my editor asked me, I, I brought to her attention this case of a, a girl in high school who had been raped by some of her classmates. And she said, how often does this happen? And the answer was, I don't know. And the experts say there's no way to know. And then she said, hmm, <laughs> why don't you figure it out? And so that it, 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 it was a recognition that there was a gap in understanding that, um, that maybe only a journalist could fill. Um, and I think that's sort of the area where journalists can be most effective um, is when they realize that there is a gap in understanding or there's just um, some piece of the puzzle that is not there. And that for whatever reason, because other people are busy with their jobs um, or a very narrow piece of, of, of the, the question, they don't have the time or the capacity or the interest in sort of getting down to, you know, getting to the bottom of that question. So that's where we can, and it's really gratifying to do that. What would you like to say to those of us who want to join journalism, but are reluctant to do so seeing the crisis surrounding the field? Well, I think I would tell you that I think journalism is going to be in crisis for a while longer. It's been in crisis essentially since I got into journalism in 2005. And I've managed to have jobs and do great journalism anyway. So I wouldn't be so discouraged by the crisis. I think the crisis does provide opportunities, but I would say to really try to think outside the box. Don't be, um, you know, don't feel like you must get a job at the Hindu or NDTV or something else or else it's not worth your time. There are a lot of outlets out there, both in India and outside of India, and in particular outside of India. India is a fascinating place that much of the world knows very little about, but feels they should know more about. So that's a great opportunity for a young journalist. Freelance, find places, but you know, really, if it's your passion, you must do it. And, um, and you should do it because it is a great, um, it's a great public contribution when it's done well. And so um, you have to though be aggressive and you have to pursue the opportunities. Um, just as you would, just as ardently as you pursue anything else in your life. Um, but they are there and they're, they're up for grabs, they're up for the taking and just keep trying. Don't take, um, you know, getting turned down for an internship or having a job or having a, a journalism pitch rejected, any of that. Don't take it personally, just keep going and build up your own resilience because the more resilient you are, the better you will, able, you will be to, to kind of showcasing the, the resilience of other people you're writing about in your career. And traveling is an integral part of your job as a journalist, but if you're traveling as a part of a vacation, how do you ensure you're actually unwinding? And if you don't do that, what is your idea of a great vacation? <laughs> I think it's impossible <laughs> these days to completely unwind. I, I think that we are now officially all sort of cyborgs. Um, but I definitely always pack novels 
And even when I'm on work trips, I make a point of um, dedicating time to unwind. I think it's really, really important. So, um, you know, pack a bathing suit if you're going somewhere with, with a pool, pack a novel, um, you know, sign up for a yoga class, whatever you need to do to make sure that you um, spend good quality time just recovering because journalism is exhausting. It's really fun, but it's really tiring too. We're done with the questions, ma'am. Thank you so much for answering them. Sure. Your coverage of the sexual assaults in US public schools was very inspiring. I love how your curiosity helped talk to people and how you try to genuinely feel for what people go through. And uh, I love how you said that as a journalist, you can acknowledge reality. On behalf of the students and faculty of the Department of Media Studies and the Management of Christ Team to the University, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude to you, Emily Ma'am, for gracing the occasion with such a thought-provoking lecture. Today, we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts, and this is definitely encouraging for us students and teachers of media and journalism in our future ventures. A big thank you to Joyal Sir for organizing this talk. Thank you, Manjit Sir and team from IT Services for your background support to set this event up. Thank you to our participants who have joined in from different institutions around the country. We appreciate you for your active participation and the questions for our guest. A feedback form has been shared with all our participants. Please do fill it. Your feedback will be useful as we organize other events in the future. We hope to see you all again soon. Have a good evening ahead.